Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> For those of you that may not know, uh, John Bresser passed away this week. Um, he was down at um, the Halifax Hospice. He had very good care. Um, I got to sit with him the night before he passed, had prayer with him. Um, one of the things that John had expressed to me when he first came into the church is the fact that he had no children. Um, his sister was, at that time, lived down, I think, south Florida. So he didn't really have anybody, and he didn't want to be alone. Uh, as he got older, he didn't want to die alone. And um, I just want to thank the church for their outpouring of love to him. John, everywhere he went, always spoke very highly of the people that he worshipped with. Um, he knew you loved him. He knew you cared for him. And he was not alone when he died. And I believe that God used this church and you guys to help him through this period of his life. Amen. Um, Today I want to talk about Jesus' words when he said, Remember me. You find that I'm inscribed on that desk right there. I want you to think about what that means to you sitting here in good health, fairly good health, but you know you're not going to die tomorrow unless a truck falls on you or something like that. And what it means to somebody like John, who in the last few months knew that he wasn't going to get better. Where he was at was going to be the last place he was going to be until uh, he slept in death. What does it mean to remember Jesus and to know Jesus? We live our lives day to day. We do all the things that we're supposed to do, our responsibilities. And it's so easy to get so caught up in that. Can you turn me down some? To get so caught up in that that we don't remember who Jesus is and what he requires of us. What does Jesus require of you? Can you answer that question? What does Jesus require of you? What did you say, Rosa? To worship him. Can you worship him without actually spending time with him? No. Now listen, it's easy for us to put that off and to not draw as close to Him as we should because we have so many things we got to take care of. And we think, well, I'll do that tomorrow. But when you get to the point where John was, I can bet you that's the most important thing on your mind. Well, you guys got quiet on that I want you to think of that, okay? I can put off thinking about what it means to meet Him, what it means to stand before Him, because I get so busy and caught up in my own life and my own responsibilities. But when you get to that point where you're laying in the bed and you know you're not going to leave that bed, you're going to die in that bed, and then the next face you're going to see is Him, I think your priorities definitely change. But wouldn't you like to have peace before you get to that bed? Instead of having to find it in that bed, Amen. you can find it there, but it's hard. Those of you who've seen death, death doesn't come easily. It's not like what you see in the movies. And usually it doesn't come fast unless it's something, <coughs> like I said, tragic or, or a heart attack. But to know that there's somebody there with you, to know that somebody cares, to feel the touch, of another human being, to hear their voice, to hear prayer <coughs> offered for them. That's a comfort. Amen. But that comfort only goes so far if that person does not know Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, it's a 100% guarantee that every one of you in this room today will face that at some point in your life. You're either going to see Him through the portal <coughs> of death, or you're going to see Him while you're still in this flesh. Which one do you think is going to be easier? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Death. I don't want to see him in death. I want to see him in life. I want to be
be that generation that sees him coming in the clouds of glory that never sees death. Amen. Amen. But to do that, I've got to be a totally different person than I am today. Amen. Because it can't be me, it's got to be him living in me. Amen. 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 So listen. <coughs> Turn with me again to our text this morning found in John chapter 15. You familiar with this chapter? Yeah. Ray, I picked this because I thought of you, because I know you like this. I was thinking about John, I was thinking about the church, and I was thinking, what? It's communion. What, what can I say in a very short period of time? Okay? And God brought me to this chapter in these set of verses. <coughs> chapter 15. This discourse you find only in the Gospel of John. Now, you won't find the communion and the Passover celebrated in the Gospel of John. You realize that? Okay? But what you find is this. Jesus telling his disciples before he goes to the cross who he is, what he is, who they are, and what they are. And that without him, they can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. Jesus tells him that I am the true vine, and my Father is that vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Here's another thing for you to think about. This year, we are in the first two weeks of this year. So think about last year. How much fruit did you actually bear for Jesus Christ last year? Did you bear any? If you're bearing no fruit, what was Jesus' words? You'll be taken away. But if you do bear fruit, what's he going to do to you? Ooh, you guys ever prune anything at your house? I'm glad I'm not a plant. But you know what? I am a plant. And I get pruned, and it hurts. But it's for a purpose, and that purpose is so that we bear more fruit. But brothers and sisters, if you are bearing no fruit for your God, you better look at your relationship with Him. Because if you come to that bed where John just passed from, I'll leave you on that thought. You this is verse 3, are already clean because of the what? Word. Because of the word which I have spoken to you. And here's a word, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, will bear, what? Much fruit. For without me, you can, what? Nothing. Nothing. Now, the question is, what does it mean to bear fruit for Him? Does that mean that you bring a hundred souls to the kingdom every year? I'm going to tell you no. What does it mean to bear fruit for Jesus Christ? Paul says, that we are given gifts. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That the Holy Spirit gives us individual gifts. Do you know what your gift is? You have to know what that gift is to be able to bear fruit for and in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Do you have the gift of hospitality? That's how you bear fruit. Do you have the gift of administration? That's how you bear fruit. Do you have the gift of music? That's how you bear fruit. The gift of teaching, preaching, that's how you bear fruit. Whatever God has gifted you with, that is the gift that you use to bear fruit for Him. And are you using your talents and your gifts for His glory and His benefit? Let me tell you something. In my experience, I have witnessed a lot of people who could speak really well. 
but I would much rather be in the presence of somebody who had a loving and caring heart that showed Jesus Christ just by their everyday actions than somebody who could speak well. Amen. Amen. Because words are cheap. Amen. The actions that follow those words for actions themselves. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a musician. Jesus called us to love. Amen. We can all do that. Is that right? Yes. Now believe me, John didn't need a sermon. John didn't need a good teacher. John needed somebody who had compassion. Who could sit with him. And even though he couldn't say nothing, could still be comfortable in his presence. Who could touch him. And look in his eyes and say, John, I'm here. And I saw that. And John saw it too. Those are the things that touch your lives. Those are the things that make a difference in this life. here this morning to celebrate communion. Jesus said, remember me. As often as you do this, you will remember me. Remember that he is the vine and you are only the branch. And if you are not attached to the vine, you will do absolutely nothing. And you can go through this life deceiving yourselves, thinking that you're right with God. And in the end, on that day, you may hear those words, depart from me because I never... Those are going to be the worst words anybody who has ever lived will hear. Can you imagine going through your whole life, closing your eyes in death, thinking you're okay? That your relationship with God is good? And you wake up on that day and find out you're with the goats? And you're thinking, dude, I'm in the wrong line. How do I get over there with the sheep? And it's too late. You got this life. You got right now. You got today. What are you going to do with it? The Bible tells you for a reason that today is a day of salvation. It's because you're not promised tomorrow. That's right. That's right. Okay? What will you do now? In this present moment. Will you give your heart to Him? Will you allow Him to give you peace? Will you obey? What I've experienced in the last month and what I've seen and what God has shown me is that as a nation, as a people, as an entire world, we have become so comfortable with sin that we don't even know what righteousness really is. I want you to think about church people and how they live their lives. And we're church people. Okay? And we are supposed to be righteous because He lives in us. And we have become so acquainted and comfortable with sin that 20 year olds don't know that it's wrong to not produce children without being married. Not to live together without being married because that's what God wants. And the churches accept that. I don't accept that because that's against God's word. Amen. Amen? I thought I'd get more than one. Amen. Listen, does God call you for morality? Does God call you for righteousness? And it's your choice whether you will accept it or not. And when you accept this communion today, you are taking His blood, His body, that He broke for you so you could be righteous. Amen. Sin has become such a part of our lives that we think we're righteous because we're not as bad as the world. Do you know why bad things happen to good people? Because there's no such thing as good people. <laughs> Jesus answered that question when he said, when the wall fell on those people, were they more righteous than anybody else? When the Romans mixed the blood and the offering with the people they were killing, were they more righteous than anybody else? What did he mean by that? What he meant was, you're not righteous. It is only by God's grace that you're able to stand before Him. Amen. But yet we think we're righteous. And we're good. And we're not. 
You can do nothing without Him. Amen. Amen. But in Him, He calls you to a much higher form of living. He calls you to be righteous. Amen. Obedience. It's not a bad word. When you get to the position where John just left from, all these things will start to make sense to you. At that point, it can be too late. My Lord. Live it now. Accept Him now. Give your heart to Him now. For today is the day of salvation. Amen. Amen. We are going to break up. We are going to have the women go into what color work? Blue. The blue room. <laughs> All the men will go back into the social hall. Uh, and we'll have our foot washing. It's an open communion. Everyone is invited to participate. When we come back, please sit in the second and then every other row so the deacons can have room to serve us.